So yes, we're good. Yes, we can. All right. We're good. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm so privileged to be here. Uh, what an amazing uh, gathering. We are 125 people collectively on this call today. And thank you so much, Rohini, for uh, being who you are and doing what you do because you are a network weaver and you have woven this network that has come together. So thank you so much. Um, today, what I thought would be uh, interesting to do is to use this time as a space uh, to think. Um, so I do not intend to, um, so to say, should tell you something, but I intend to present a few frames, open a few structures, and uh, in the breaks in between, uh, would love to hear perspectives. These are very surreal times, and, uh, and I think more than ever before, uh, the question of networks and network effects is at the center of the mind of humanity. Uh, and even people who have no association whatsoever with mathematics are spending time and energy to understand what are network effects and how do they happen and what is exponential and and so these are very interesting times ahead of us. Um, uh, today I don't intend this to be a technology session, so I am not going to go into software architecture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I essentially discuss uh, together with all of you a set of fundamentals that should inform the way we use technology, rather than suggest saying use this technology or that one, because each one to their own uh, in terms of what you do. Um, uh, so I hope you have a cup of tea or coffee or milk or hot water or whatever be your poison of the day uh, to sort of just interact as we go along in this. So um, let me get started. Um, I'm going to quickly spend a few minutes. Uh, did the screen get struck? Are you able to see? Oh, yeah, it's moving now. Yeah, it's All right, good. there you yeah. go. Okay. Uh, so a bit of background. Um, and then followed by a bit of uh, discussion around what are network effects. Uh, sometimes I may get a bit technical. So please, technical, I don't mean technology, but technical. Uh, and forgive me for that. Um, and then we talk a little bit about value interactions. And we talk about shared infrastructure and its role in creating. Uh, so if you, if you see the, the call to discussion that we had today was about power of networks, right? And essentially, we will express that those through these three topics, network effects, value interactions, and shared infrastructure. How do you use this to, to gain uh, or to leverage or to extract the power of a network? Uh, so a little bit about the background. Um, this whole idea started with, uh, um, with a lot of thinking about what does it take to create services for 3.4 billion people who less, earn less than five and a half dollars per day, uh, which essentially is the definition, global definition of uh, people living under stress and poverty. And of course, varies by country. And but I, that's not the point. The point we're talking about here is that we're talking about issues that are so a set of, if you will, um, challenges that are large, dynamic, and complex. And if anything, COVID has proven, uh, it's proven that they just got larger, more dynamics, uh, and more complex. And hence, uh, the quest is that the response uh, has to be at scale, with speed, and it has to be sustainably. So this is the starting question as to why even should we care about network effects? You know, um, I, I found a very interesting quote by Albert Bartlett. The greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function, uh, mathematically speaking. Because these problems, uh, these are characteristics of an exponential system. And hence the response cannot be linear because there is no linear response possibility that can actually deal with an exponential uh, problem. So that, that behooves us to think about responses which are also exponential in nature. And it is not necessary, we, we struggle to understand exponential problems, so obviously it kind of translates into our struggle to understand exponential responses. And this is the quest, that is what we are 
searching for, that is what we are applying our mind to, that our problems are exponential, all of us know, uh, are our responses exponential? And what does it take to create exponential responses is the real uh, question that we are trying to get to. And hence we are here talking about network effects amongst many things that need to be uh, worked upon. One thing that we learned, a few things that we picked up from uh, our learnings, um, from what the work we have done so far, like Rohini mentioned over the last five years and interactions with hundreds of thousands of people who have been like you working to alleviate our challenges in, in the, uh, across the civil societies in different countries is that the classical mindset uh, or the classical approach has been to focus on scale what works. So if a certain response works in a certain geography, then so how do we replicate? How do we do more of that? A classical response has been to use networks to distribute solutions, saying I have a good answer in education or I have a good lesson or I have a good healthcare protocol or I have a good way of engaging a community in conservation of water. And then I find ways and means to distribute this solution through a network and to control the evolution because with scale comes the concern or the, or the challenge of fidelity, of quality, things will go, will dilute, will break down. And so we have to set the right control points to be able to control the evolution. Otherwise at scale, uh, uh, and, and what we have learned so far, is that it might be interesting uh, for some of us to think about, is it about scale what works or is the real question what works at scale? Um, and that is the, the question uh, that we are trying to, and, and our quest has told us that shifting the equilibrium by small quantities, which we call as plus one thinking, is really what works at scale. Um, if you go back in history, whether you look at large movements, uh, different kinds of freedom struggles, different kinds of right movements, or if you look at different kinds of technological movements, um, or if you look at uh, different kinds of uh, uh, networks that have got built up, they always got built up by making gradual changes, but at scale, uh, at very, very large scale over time, right? Obviously, there's a time construct to those. The second question that we do think a lot about is, do we, should we distribute solutions or should we uh, distribute the ability to solve? Uh, and this requires, again, uh, a deep network thinking because distributing the ability to solve is developing the network in a very different way than distributing solution, which is a distribution network. So distribution network is different from an enabling network or an orchestrating network. So we think about saying, okay, if we have to really achieve something at scale with the participation of people, with the, with the civil society actually acting on, on what they, they deeply care about, then we have to distribute the ability to, to solve rather than design a solution and distribute it. And that network design is very different design. And third point, which is controlling the evolution, uh, should we change the question is how do we evolve the controls um, and, and all the work that has happened over decades on how do we redesign controls such that there's a sense of agency, there's a sense of uh, participation, there's a sense of ownership by different elements of the civil society to be able to do. So, so when we're thinking about networks, the classical networks in the commercial construct have thought about scale what works, distributing solutions and controlling the evolution. That's the way network thinking took root. But in the societal context, we might need to make certain important uh, underpinning changes to be able to really leverage networks at scale for developing societies. Thinking about what is the amount of change that the social fabric can observe, what's plus one, how do we distribute the ability so that people can solve with their own agency and how do you evolve the controls so that uh, the ownership, uh, the responsibility, the accountability is slowly and steadily taken over by the people who obviously want to act in the interest of their well-being and their lives. Interestingly now with the COVID situation, some interesting thoughts even got further sharpened. So we said challenges are large, dynamic, complex, great. Response is scale with speed, sustainably fine. And we said, what, so what should we do? We should look at you know, thinking cycles, plus one thinking cycles, gradual changes at scale, distributing solvability, 
there is a word solvability. I was kind of a little concerned for a while whether grammatically it's correct, but apparently it is. Um, and network effects. And we said we should do this by empowering, enabling, and making things simple and unbundled. And then COVID hit. And we realized that there are more parameters that we need to worry about in this journey, which is how do we repurpose what we already have? If a network exists, how do we repurpose that network? If connections exist, how do we repurpose? If a solution exists, how do we repurpose? Amongst the 127 people on this call, how many things already exist that can be repurposed and rapidly deployed across a network? And what does it mean? Classically, networks were playing the role of enabling, uh, but there is a massive need now for orchestrating. Because in the end, uh, uh, the, the participants of the society who are suffering have multiple dimensions to deal with. It's about health, it's about education, it's about livelihoods. Uh, it's about security, it's about sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. And so multiple things would need to be orchestrated. So networks become even more significant and central in thinking. And while the initial idea was saying networks are great for empowering the ecosystem, uh, it's very evident now that they are as critical, as important um, to, to nudge uh, the entire ecosystem towards equity. And Rohini did mention, and, and she's touched upon some of these points, because we do draw a lot of inspiration on this thinking from, from her perspectives on how society should be developed over time. So with this as a background, we sort of come to the discussion today as to, we'll talk about network effects uh, across civil society, government and business, uh, what we term as Samad Sarkar Bazaar. We'll talk about what are value interactions uh, and give you and share with you some of the frames, some of the ways, methods of designing things. Because uh, we hope that at the end of the discussion today, you'll be able to take away something that you can apply, that you can use. Uh, and we'll talk about how do value interactions designed to improve capacity of the system, effectiveness and governance. And we'll talk about the role of shared infrastructure and shared infrastructure that can democratize knowledge, processes, resources, technology, data, uh, and so on and so forth. So how do you create an exponential response leveraging the power of networks? Uh, is So I just wanted to sort of come in through the background as to where we are, our mind is at when we're talking about the things that we'll talk for the rest of the time today. It's very important that at the back of this is a set of core values. Uh, and it's very important for us to ensure that while we leverage network effects, uh, network effects are done with a certain sense of purpose, a certain mission to restore the agency of the network because network effects can also have an extremely uh, controlling character. Uh, networks are known for being very effective control systems or very effective, uh, uh, so to say, uh, uh, mechanisms to guide the behavior in a certain direction and that can be positive and negative. And so it's important to hold certain core values very, very strong that we, we are care about restoring the agency of the participants in society. We care about diversity. We care about catalyzing interactions amongst people and helping people do things that, that they believe is right for themselves. It's about system leadership, looking at different moving parts and bringing the moving parts together rather than you know, letting the system get taken hostage or take hostage to something. It's about distributing ability rather than concentrating power. It's about inspiring co-creation amongst the different actors. It's about sharing value and not capturing value. It's about building public goods. It's about empowering the ecosystem with data. And it's about seeking rapid evolution because uh, experience so far says that whatever we build, usually it's proven wrong very, very rapidly because the environment, the socioeconomic structures, the demographics, the economics, all these factors, the politics, they change uh, rapidly. And so if we build any network that is not able to rapidly evolve, then the network itself has its own gravity and its own challenges uh, in how to deal with some of these problems. So these are important considerations as we go forward. So let's, let's take a quick minute to, few minutes to sort of double click on what do you mean by network effects? And then I would love to hear some reactions uh, after that. Um, so network effects, and I just want to highlight, we're talking about effects, which means a network that has effects. Uh, so I'm not going to obviously go into definition of what are networks, what are different types of networks. Networks is a science in itself, but we're talking about what is the effect of a network. Um, and 
classically, um, when we look at network effects, uh, the fundamental definition itself is that if you have in your network, whichever area you work in, a set of actors, and then you add a new actor. Network effect means that when you add a new actor, it is valuable to all the existing actors. So if you are into, into education, if you add a new uh, uh, element, like a new teacher or a new student or a new expert or a new delivery mechanism, it's valuable to all the actors. So that is essentially the effect part of a network, that whenever you add an actor, it is valuable to all the existing actors, right? Uh, and that's a very simple definition of a network effect, right? So every actor is valuable to existing actors. Now, in, in practice, some of the, sometimes the network effects can be positive, sometimes the network effects can be negative. So for example, some of the work uh, that we are seeing happening in the urbanization space, uh, you bring in a, an actor who could be a certain functionary or a certain part of the government system, and the network starts uh, stalling or network starts slowing down, which means the, the interaction between people starts reducing because that actor is seen as a, as a problem or a threat to the entire network's uh, value creation capability. So there could be negative network effects. Um, and um, you know, I, I'm sure some of you work in the ecological and environmental space, you know that when you add certain actors in an ecosystem, it starts creating negative network effects. And so the ability to understand uh, which are the positive uh, effect kind of actors and which are the negative kind of effect actors this is a very important exercise. And it's not that you cannot add those actors, but then you have to design the system to, to hedge against the negative effects of certain actors. And so that's a very important element of the discussion as to whatever be your network, you might be in arts, culture, um, you might be in, uh, in, health, in, in uh, justice, uh, some of you work in livelihoods, um, who are the actors and uh, which actor addition creates value for all the other actors. Because most of the time when people look at networks, they think about, I am here and does the addition of the actor create value for me, for my program, for my, for my initiative? The real challenge is to say, does it create value for, for all the other actors and then to what extent? or does it create negative value for some actors and how do we deal with that? The second is that most of the networks are formed in what is called as the broadcast mode. Broadcast mode means if you have N actors, then the effect of your work is multiplied by N. It is like a, it's like a sum of N, right? So if I had 10 farmers, my effect is equal to 10 farmer worth of outcome. If I had 2000 farmers, the impact of my work is worth 2000 farmers. Uh, which is the sigma n, which is classically known as the broadcast network, which is that the effect of my work is equal to the number of actors that I am able to serve. Um, you know, um, to 20,000 children, 50,000 schools, 70,000 adults and girls, whatever be the mission that you're on. But it is, but the real design of a network is when you can actually design it for interaction between the actors, because that's how the exponentiation starts, which essentially is the value of a network, is, if you have designed it for network effects, should be n square. Which means that you have the ability to create interactions between the actors rather than only with you. It's not you interacting with the actors, but that you can create interaction between the various actors. That's n square. And of course, over time, if you mature it even more, then you really get an exponential actor, which is called two to the power n. But I will not go into the mathematics of it today, uh, because these are essentially governed by certain network effects and laws of network building. But I would certainly like to request you to look at saying, don't look at your network as sum of the number of actors, but the square of the number of actors. Uh, and then you have to figure out, or you have to really think about, how do we create interactions between the actors? Because without that, the n square does not come, right? Because the n square actually is a very simple formula. I have n people in the network. They can obviously interact with n minus one people because you can't interact with yourself. Technically you can, but, um, and, and that's what leads to this very simple articulation of saying it's actually uh, 
n square minus n at very large quantities n square minus n doesn't mean anything it's just almost equal to n square that's how n square comes into play but the real question is is your network such that if you are if you have artists they interact amongst each other rather than they interact with you if you have children then they interact with teachers teachers interact with teachers uh, children interact with children so the more interactions the more is the possibility or the thickness of the network as one would say it's a very important element of thinking about about this the other thing that one could look at is how do you add sides right so if you're in education so you have teachers you have parents you have students you have tutors uh, so each addition of a side is also leading to evolution of a thicker and thicker network so so who are the different sides in the game you are in if you are working on just this who are the different sides and how do you get different sides to join the network because each side comes with its own family of actors um, and so how do you add sides and are the sides every addition of a side is it valuable to the network or is it in a, reducing the uh, the value and the second aspect is not only adding sides are you adding networks themselves are you connecting networks for example you know you have i know that there are people from samhita here who samhita is a network and then similarly dasra is a network but the interconnection between samhita and dasra is a is a network of networks right and how do you create network of networks so i was just giving you a set of complexion or colors of how do you build out uh, just by adding actors so that they are valuable or by adding sides which come with the family of their own actors or adding many 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 networks so that the networks become thicker denser um, uh, over time and why do we really care about it right because for example network effects essentially help all of you drive certain shifts for example if you're working in the ecological space and now it's proven in resilience thinking that if you really want to create shifts in ecological constructs and the core idea here be, be, being about building resilience then network effects are known to create more resilient systems because of the connections the bindings um, the interplay between different actors and so network effects give more resilience if you are into healthcare like you know some of my colleagues on the call from echo are then it gives resilience to that entire network of uh, healthcare professionals if you are into into you know civil um uh, civic governance at a village level or a, or, a, or a district level it gives more and more resilience because the thickness of the network as it is called is the one that is it also of course is empowering because networks uh, give you visibility into the whole supply chain uh, so if you're looking at improving income levels of farmers or if you're looking at how do i do better value appropriation uh, to the right place uh, then if you don't if you can't see the network then you cannot improve the value appropriation so it is empowering to be part of a network than to be a node uh, alone of course it amplifies uh, in a big way for example if you had a program like polio eradication and a new actor joins a new side joins called government then suddenly it amplifies the efforts in a very big way if you are able to balance the positive and negative effects of of different actors joining or it catalyzes people to do things that otherwise they would not have done right so this was the polio example for example if you go back and study the details of how satyagraha happened um it was a civil disobedience movement but it catalyzed people to come out with their own ways of civil disobedience and it was not that there was a menu of civil disobedience that was sent out to people but it catalyzed people to take their own uh, action their own make their own meaning and participate in the entire so networks allow you to to catalyze action as appropriate in context of the people what they are trying to do of course you can sustain because in networks the line between consumers and producers uh, starts blurring uh and that's very important for in many ways to to think about in at least in many sectors around how do you think about agency um and for example when we are looking at the work we are doing at extra foundation with diksha when teachers become producers of content that are used to train teachers it has a very very different kind of a sustainability impact rather than experts creating contents and teacher becoming consumer so when the producer and consumer start coming together 
it starts creating more and more capabilities around around this. Of course, networks have a problem called the chicken and egg problem. There are many ways to solve chicken and egg problem. I'll just touch upon two, three to give you an idea. Because you start forming a network, then who comes first? Will people join? Will the effect be positive? How do you onboard people? Those kind of questions. There are many strategies to do it, but uh, to give you some examples, for example, piggyback is a very typical game used where you would ride on other people's networks uh, based on what you're trying to do. And so uh, weave uh, your uh, game plan or your initiative or your policies or whatever changes you are trying to bring to society into other networks that are already mobilizing. So that's called piggyback or seeding that you bring in some very high quality uh, actors into the network who then draw all the other actors to come or you bring in some very high quality technology or solutions into the network. So you seed it, it with something that propels people to, to come and join. Uh, of course, microcosm, which is you start creating small, small effects uh, in villages, in districts, and then find ways and means to start joining up uh, and creating. So there are many ways, but I wanted to say that building a network is not easy. You always have this chicken and egg problem, which is a very big problem. Because unless the, um, the uh, side A is there, the side B doesn't play. And if the side B is not there, A doesn't play. The question is, how do you bring A and B at the same time? Um, and many of the networks across the world uh, have fizzled because, uh, because of the inability to crack the chicken and egg problem. Brilliant designs, excellent minds, can't crack chicken and egg. Uh, the network does not drive any, uh, any uh, outcomes in that sense. Lastly, uh, before we open up for a quick line of conversation, uh, a word about curves. Uh, classically, when we think about programs, initiatives that we do, uh, the curve that dominates our mind uh, is the normal distribution curve, right? And this is the one that uh, it gives us a meaning of sense of quality where we say value, some things are good, many things around the center are average, and some things are bad, right? Um, and of course, this is volume. But when you uh, when you think about networks, the curve actually has a very different construct, which is called the power curves. Uh, and in power curves, when you're looking at uh, value versus volume, it is not defined by good, average, or bad, because it, power curves are not judgmental in nature, like Gaussian curves are, which is about this whole normal distribution on the left side. Essentially, what you look for is few things which are very famous on a network. It's like if, if, uh, if Rohini posted a video on the network, there will be millions of people who will watch it. Um, whereas there is a fairly large space where people who are co-creating very specific solutions for their specific problems uh, exist. And there's a very long tail where people are collaborating, but very locally, what you would call the participating zone. And classically, people, when they form network, they try to see if I can maximize the famous space, and that's missing the point. Networks are most powerful when you are great at the co-creation and the collaboration, which is very low uh, net, systemic level effect, but extremely intense contextual effect at scale, hundreds of thousands of people making micro changes. Um, and that is why the, the very thinking that good quality things, what is the meaning of quality needs to be examined if you are really serious about driving network effects because power curves are very different from Gaussian normal distributions. And this is a mindset, this is not mathematics. I'm not trying to explain math here. I'm explaining a mindset because these things actually govern the way we think. Um, so I just wanted to sort of highlight that, that there are differences in the way we think about, about networks. Um, would love to open up uh, for any thoughts, any questions, any reactions uh, before we sort of deep dive a bit deeper. Thanks, Sanjay. Um, a few people have uh, wanted to raise questions. Meena from uh, Neeti, uh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask that question, please? Sure. Um, can you all hear me? 
Yes. Yes. Yes, Meena. Uh, firstly, thank you, Gautam and Sahana, for putting it this together. Um, and Sanjay and Rohini, I think this was the best choose of this morning. Uh, riveting uh, start, and I really look forward to the rest of the conversation. Um, I actually have uh, a comment and a question. Uh, in the, it's something that we had suspected um, for many years, but I think this last few weeks of how things have panned out have really uh, brought it to the fore that where things have been most impactful, whether we look at food distribution in this uh, times or the way, you know, migrants are being given um, uh, staples or rations or whatever else, or even in the way uh, harvest is being sort of managed, agriculture harvest is being managed and taken at the last mile. The most effective solutions have been where uh, there have been small pockets of communities, uh, you know, and like you rightly said, Sanjay, in terms of what works at scale instead of, you know, scale that works, you know, in terms of how we are able to, you know, wherever there has been an opportunity where there is a, we have demonstrated an ability to distribute uh, solving uh, mindset as opposed to solutions, it's actually worked most effective, you know, whether it's been healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. So as we go along, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts uh, based on your experience and what, uh, you know, what you see as, as trends and going forward. A, uh, if, we, if this is the future and if we can sort of look at build, building on it uh, in terms of power of networks, in these little pockets of uh, collaboration and you know, uh, the co-creation that is happening and the power of networks at, at smaller units, how can we ensure consistency across multiple uh, uh, smaller units? Uh, second is when you talk about the number of sites, we've also seen in, in the last few weeks, you know, typically the kind of collaborations that we have seen to say deliver healthcare, we have seen many other sites join the four. And that has actually resulted in a lot of positive uh, outcomes which were unexpected. You know, it's really helped us reach uh, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, solution or a, a kind of sustainability that was perhaps not thought of. Uh, how can we make sure that is in, again, in your experience, is it important for a certain number of sites to remain consistent across while you keep adding number of sites? Um, so just, I mean, uh, these are just uh, points to sort of ponder, discuss, no, no, and, and the question. Thanks, Nina. Uh, Gautam, you want to take a few questions and you want to respond? Or we go um, I, I, I'll group the, a few of the next questions and you can take this one. Okay, fine. So, um, thank you for those observations. Um, uh, very, very, very well said. And like, like we were discussing a little while back that the power of a network lies in the zone of co-creation and collaboration rather than the zone of famous uh, is very important to attract new actors, new sites, new resources, new capital. But the actual uh, transformation, equilibrium change, uh, working at a resilience uh, level happens in the co-creation and collaboration zone. Um, and as we go down uh, the discussion today, uh, we would spend a little more time on how do you design uh, for, for this? And so we have certain conversations coming up. So I will, I will just acknowledge that, yes, this is, exactly uh, what we were talking about. And we will talk about how do you design value interactions in these zones? Uh, because how do you maintain consistency? How, how do you maintain uh, uh, what is the role of the uh, different kinds of infrastructure? So we'll touch upon that. The second thing I wanted to talk about uh, quickly was your point about sites, which is that you know there'll be new sites. Uh, there are always certain sites which are, which are going to be core, uh, right? Uh, so for example, if you were looking at education, the teacher, uh, the the uh, the the teacher and student interaction is what one in network theory would call as core interaction. This is the this is where the value gets created. So if it is a uh, a healthcare situation, so the interaction between the ASHA worker and the village person is the core. And so those sides are always the foundational core sides. 
and then the other actors uh, come in based on context and the value that they can add in that context sometimes earlier sometimes later and even across different parts of a country as large as india certain network certain sides may be stronger weaker because of the context in which they are playing so i just wanted to clarify that yes there will always be certain core sides based on the core interaction for example you use uber every day the core side is you and the uber driver these are the two core Uh, uh, two connected questions actually uh, around kind of uh, how norms in uh, networks evolve. Uh, so especially you know, how do norms around uh, what is positive value within network evolve? Um, because is there an underlying kind of ideological conversation with uh, within the actors in the network uh, that has to evolve, and how does that happen? And so connected question is you know what are negotiating mechanisms? Uh, that typically safeguard the network uh, against actors that reduce value. So once we've decided what is positive value, uh, you know, what are negotiating mechanisms which kind of safeguard against uh, risks, uh, against negative entries? Yeah. All right, the Divya, other two questions. Yeah, Divya from Civis and then Saryu from up. Uh, good morning. So uh, I'm from Civis. It's basically a civic tech platform, which uh, enables a dialogue between uh, policy and citizens. So what I wanted to understand is that a situation wherein one of the key actors is the government itself. How does the concept of networks wherein every other actor that uh, is supposed to add value to each other play out? Because when the government is involved, it's a complex dynamic that is uh, at at work. Sariyo, if you want to add yours as well. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Sariyo from Apti Institute. Uh, thank you very much for organizing. Uh, this has been fantastic so far. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on Tarun's question and now I realize Divya's question as well. Uh, specifically thinking about the implications of regulations and policies, uh, which actually in some instances might hinder the network effects, sometimes the positive effects as well. Um, how does one think about framing that and what does that mean for uh, thinking about scaling networks or networks at scale? Uh, and this is of course assuming that the regulation or the policy itself comes from a valid constitutional framework. Great. I think all of these uh, questions sort of converge on the concept of uh, friction in network effects. So friction is a very important role to play in network effects uh, and by the way friction has a very important role to play in our lives because if there was no friction we won't be able to walk um, and that is why while designing network effects or while thinking through your respective initiatives you have to use uh, the concept of friction and really think about it very 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 i'll give you some illustrations for example uh, the question of trust or the question of how do we ensure that the negative actors do not get into the system and at the same time if you design it for preventing negative actors then it becomes a very high friction system where even people who are benign or people who are actually positive hesitate from coming into the system right uh, and a classical example of that is uh, when people go to uh, say uh, social gatherings I and mean, social gatherings uh, uh, you're always uh, worried about who else is going to be there and, and are they going to be the people I want to be associated with uh, and so then people design friction to saying you only invite a selected set of people uh, but that it reduces the network's virality and its effects and so um, that is how the whole idea of community-based trust or or how do you define the root of trust and all those questions come into being. So when, even when the second question, when the key actor is the government and, and uh, we get to a point, I've been spending a lot of time with Antara to figure out what are the key nodes and elements of the network and what is the role of the government and how does government 
come into uh, is it really demand or is it supply what is its role in the network um, and uh, again the same question uh, is whether the government is causing uh, friction reducing friction is a classical question even regulation policies also boil down to the role of friction so i would like to sort of converge this whole thing into saying it's all about friction now the question is how do we design such that friction actually creates the positive network effects that we really want to see um, in terms of preventing entry which requires some people to be attested by each other before they can enter a network you will see this in many other networks where people can't enter the network unless they are attested by other members of the network right so you create uh, that kind of a friction or does the friction increase gradually over time so in some networks you can enter but your behavior in the network slowly imposes more and more conditions so because uh, your your trust uh, so to say quotient is, is is diminishing as you are behaving on the platform and increasing checks and balances are coming into play some networks will design them as um, through curation engines multiple levels of curation right saying you can't get into the network unless i approve uh, but if you got in then i will give you the right to approve who else can get in right so you can design various layers and types of curation but but friction is a very important design element and there is no straightforward answer saying do's and don'ts but the question is how do you use friction to your advantage how do you use friction to grow the network rather than shrink the network is by applying it at different uh, in your program in your initiatives in your onboarding processes as people join the network or in your um, uh, so to say ejection processes or getting people out of the network uh, as well because if if a certain behavior does not uh, go beyond a point and then you have to ensure that people exit from the network that also should be well thought through as to at what point would you actually use the friction to exit people from the network so it all boils down to how well thought out you are in terms of how to use friction thank you sanjay uh, sanjay do you have time to take more questions or do you think we should move to the second segment we can move on because some of the questions also will get answered as we go along okay. uh, and of course we will have more time for uh, for questions so uh, if you and gautam if you guys are okay uh, we can sure. yeah we're noting forward. the questions uh, we, so we'll we'll yes, take, yeah yes. okay got it so 11:26 right. we still have a bit of time and so we will have more time to sure. to get into the questions okay go then let's move on to the next segment um okay so let's talk about uh, this is what we were doing by the way um let's talk about value interactions so now we so far have come to a place where we want to see network effects uh, we want to see positive network effects we want to prevent negative network effects we want to bring more actors we want to bring uh, more and more um Uh, value if you will um so I, i just wanted to sort of uh add one point to the previous conversation uh and especially the conversation that we were having around around this this uh aspect of how do people contribute to the network um so there are typically um contribution to a network happens through two lenses uh suppose you have a network of um, uh lawyers or you have a network of doctors or you have a network of extension farm worker or farm extension workers or extension health workers or whichever field you be in so the their behavior can either be that yeah they feel that they are connected to the network or they feel that they are a member of a network and it takes a lot of work to convert people from feeling connected to becoming members because i could be yeah i'm i'm one of the so i was in odisha some time back talking to to extension farm workers and saying yeah i am also one of them i'm an intern with the state uh, livelihood mission and, and and they they associated themselves as connected to a network but they were not members and what does it mean by being members is that they understand what they are doing they have the capacities it takes a lot to take a network component an actor and make them feel that they are member of a network and not just that they have a hook or they have a connection 
and the second is that are they only uh, saying i am i am in the network so i have to contribute or are they generous for example if you look at healthcare networks if you look at an asha worker um they may feel that they are connected and because they are they are an asha worker so that deems them connected and they are they have to contribute because this is their job the real challenge of a network builder is to move people who feel that they are connected and they have to contribute to people who think they are members and that they are generous with their time capacity that that they go beyond uh, what the norm is uh, because that's how norm changes happen when people actually at mass in a network start doing what is right with the agency and and this is another very important facet of how many actors if you were to map and traverse your network how many actors are just connected contributors and how many actors actually are are generous members that tells us what is the the quality of that network what is the the depth of that network if you will and we'll come back to this but i just wanted to start this value conversation with this construct that value happens uh, in a network our value is uh, so first and foremost the question that comes down to is what is this network so a network is made of nouns right i use this term simply because uh, noun is a noun so a noun is uh, in in network science what you would call as a node uh, and then there are verbs which are how are these nouns connected most of the time uh, we may have a very deep understanding of nouns probably but it takes a lot to get a deep understanding of the verbs um and how do these people interact so that uh, one can go ahead and uh, strengthen the verbs or introduce new verbs so i'm a i'm i'm a teacher teaching in a class uh and there are a set of verbs that define the interaction between me and my student um uh, now you want to introduce a new verb so you should be doing assessments like this um then then we have to understand what are the effects on the network of introducing a verb or you are i am already teaching a subject you want me to teach differently which means you want to change my verb uh, so understanding the network and its effects is also a function of understanding what are the attributes of the noun do you want to change an attribute of the noun and or what are the characteristics of the verb and do you want to change a verb because in the end Uh, all that we are doing is going to finally translate at the roots on the ground in behaviors and actions of the nouns uh which will be manifesting as either change in attributes of the nouns or will change in the the design definition and the construct of the verbs so so that is how is the first order unpacking saying okay i have a network of abc can we visualize the network as a set of nouns and verbs different types of noun different types of verbs and if you are able to do that then we say okay here is a noun another noun here is an interaction i really care about this interaction in my network what is the value of this interaction and the way to quickly understand this is a framework called promise tools and benefits so i am i am here i'm a farmer and i have an interaction uh with uh, the guy who's going to buy my produce at a mandi uh now the question is what is the promise that i'm making in terms of my produce what are the tools for me to actually make this promise and what is the bargain what do i get in return and is this really valuable for the farmer and the person who is running the mandi and how do you improve the value of this interaction now if you don't understand uh, methodically and systematically the promise tool benefit structure of each of the interactions it's very hard to derive value from a network because uh, um it's 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 difficult to sort of guide it so um so the point is do we understand what are what are the promises what are the tools and what are the benefits 
of uh, of all the interactions or at least the key interactions that are happening in in my network the second thing important and this comes important. from this comes this comes from the history of how civilizations were formed uh, and how why am i able to hear my own voice i don't know why am i able to hear my own voice Uh, there is a bit of echo. Everyone's on there mute, so I'm not sure. Can you try? Okay, and... maybe your iPad will. Your, your iPad is unmuted. No. You sound good now. It's fine now. It's okay now. Yeah. Okay. Oh, echo is due to network issues. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Here we go. Um, the second one is which comes from how civilizations were formed, how civil societies were created over time, which is why do people actually cooperate at all? is this whole design which is called n plus one greater than n which means how do you give me a sense that if i'm talking to gautam today then my next interaction with gautam will be better than my existing interaction and if i'm able to demonstrate that then i will behave myself with gautam if if n is equal to n i may or may not and if i know that my next interaction which is the n plus one is going to be poorer than the current interaction. I will not cooperate with Gautam. And so, in network effects, this is one important thing. For example, you know, I go in the field and I am working in nutrition, and I visit a family, and I'm working with the family, uh, and the family gets a sense that the, that when you come next time, something will be better off, um, uh, both in terms of either knowledge or income or health, or getting that sense. Then the entire then the system cooperates. Or if you're working with a, there's a government official in education, so a cluster resource person who's going and talking to a head teacher in a school. If the if the interaction is purely administrative and just there to sort of fill some forms and inspect and go away, and I get a sense that you know next time when he comes again it's going to be the same thing, then that interaction starts to die and the network starts to weaken and the network over time. Uh, dwindles and the net as in the people stay the nouns stay the verbs dwindle and the network effect is lost so it's very important when you are thinking about network effects is to is to give this question a consideration saying how do i ensure that every interaction leaves behind a promise that the next interaction will be better than this interaction and delivers on it because that is how the network's uh, effects actually come into place so i just wanted to highlight this aspect of of, of how do you design value into into the into the uh, network the third important aspect i just wanted to highlight was there are three important question to make a network uh, actually deliver the impact that you want to deliver which is called means motive and opportunity um, for an interaction at a in, in a civil society setting in a village in a district um, in under stressful conditions, unstressful conditions, it's very important to be very clear what are the means of the interaction and are they the most appropriate means? What is the motive of the interaction? Do we really understand? Are there any positive slash ulterior motives? If yes, what has been the the uh, design? And third is, what is the opportunity uh, that we are creating for this interaction to happen? Because sometimes interactions will only happen if you actually induce them and so the question is how do you design um, mechanisms which could be your your communication your campaigns your triggers which fire up the network which create the opportunities for the because many a times the network doesn't fire up because the it needs impulses it needs charge it needs some people to induce energy into the network which could be through campaigns, which could be through uh, uh, you know, different kinds of events sometimes, which could be through different kinds of uh, uh, incentives. It could be sometimes policies, uh, some kind of a trigger. And we have to keep firing and like we have to keep firing our brains uh, all the time, which is also a network of, of different kinds of neurons. Um, so you have to keep firing. And the same thing is true for a, a network to achieve the system effects. You have to keep firing. So what is the design for firing constantly? And the last is, of course, is the is it designed for virality? And I hope that in the times of COVID, we all understand uh, virality very well, which is all about: do we have something to? Is the, is there is there something to do? Uh, do we have a way of doing it? Do we have a way of distributing it? 
and will it motivate the other person to do right this is how viruses also work right the virus has a as an agent to infect it has a way of infecting me i can distribute it by contact and if i distribute it you will get infected uh, so it's the same question in all network effects whether all the things that you want to achieve you want to achieve better education outcome you want to achieve better health outcome you want to achieve water security you want to achieve justice is that interaction viral which means that if a one part of the network acts does it induce other part of the network to act so how do you design for virality um, is is also a very very significant uh, consideration so i'll come to the last uh, before we again open up for this uh, and we started talking about it anyway so i'll just sort of bring it up again we talked about friction a bit um the, the because friction plays a very important role similarly trust plays a very important role um and trust uh, uh, how do you design for trust such that what is the root of trust where does it emanate from what is the role of peer to peer trust networks how do you do that and third of course is um in the context of uh, networks uh, and network effects essentially how do you um how do you um how do you how do you traverse or how do you transmit can i can i port the trust is trust trust portable can it can it travel with my interaction can it travel with my service uh, for example if i'm if i'm creating a a learning content for uh, financial uh, literacy of uh, village women uh, and it's a trustworthy content will that is that trust portable with that content or do i have to be there to actually ensure that this is the trust how do you design for trust friction i spent a little bit of time so i'm not going to repeat but i think when we talk of governance that's a massive subject that could be a two hour conversation itself and and, and underlying this question are questions around ownership who owns the network um uh, which is a very very complex question because um what is the role of the owner second is what is the accountability of negative effects of a network and what is the liability in case a network uh, effect goes wrong or it essentially ends up harming people rather than benefiting people um and these are also important design considerations when when we design for network effect uh how do we actually go and um, factor these questions into each of the elements of the network these are the nouns these are the verb so you take any value interaction and you pass it through this kind of question saying the interaction between um uh, actor a and actor b this is what i want to see how we, what's the root of trust root of trust meaning where does the trust come from why does it amplify because of peer to peer interaction how does it traverse or transmit across the interaction who owns uh, the consequences who is accountable who is liable and do we need friction to ensure that it doesn't run away it doesn't slide away it doesn't fall into a negative zone um, all our questions around uh, and we and these questions are are uh, important questions when you're designing the interactions the nouns and the verbs what are the nouns what are the verbs um and when you when you're going through these questions is where you apply back the governance and 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 trust question let me pause here uh, and also i would love to hear from you uh, any examples that you can think of right because all of you are are actually active network builders you are you are yourselves network weavers so I'd love to hear any uh, thoughts it brings to your mind saying oh i yeah i think i think i have done this or uh, i am already doing it because for the community on the call it will be it will be good to hear what are you thinking yeah okay so um we have a bunch of questions so i want to tell you uh, <laughs> what we will do is that we're going to take all the questions from the chat window and everything and create an faq document also based on the questions that we got from the registration forms and you know you might have to give us a little bit of time and then we will share it to the team cuz obviously we won't be able to do justice to all the questions coming in today so um to sanjay's request of what what does this mean to your community could i just call upon harsh to uh, share on that as well as ask your questions because you've been diligently raising your hands for a while now so thanks for your patience harsh are you there hello is he able to unmute 
Uh, I can unmute him. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me uh, now? Yes, I can. Yes. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Uh, actually, this uh, is shifting on my phone, so therefore I got lost. Thank you, sir. Uh, Gautam Rohini for giving us this charge and Sanjay when you were explaining I was uh, I was thinking that you know as if you know you are discussing about Vani. Vani is uh, almost a three decade old national platform of Indian NGOs in India and when you said about uh, put some cases and then uh, you know uh, I'll, I'll share with you some of uh, challenges uh, which I think is also very important when you are discussing network. The first one is about the diversity because till now you have said mostly the networks which are of people who are similar in nature. But if you take example of our network in Vani, we have uh, members who are of different sizes, like large organizations of uh, India are also member and you have a grassroots organization. So how to, and also various themes people are working, various geographies they are working in. So how to remain uh, relevant for all of them is always a challenge. And secondly, you talked about ownership. Now how you make it, how you ensure that the smaller one also feels that he owns the network and the larger one also feels the network. No one feels that value is given to someone else with large in size or large in budget. I think that is very important. And also second issue is about the mandate. You know, the mandate of the network has to be in such a way maintained. The values have to be maintained and the objectives have to be maintained. Secondly, the governance. I think governance, as you also touched upon that issue, is always a challenge because how you keep uh, you know, a space for a, even a smaller organization to be part of the governing board or something like that. I think that is also very important. Friction definitely comes in. It is very difficult to, I think, even, uh, you know, like organizations like Wani, when we present our audit reports to our members in AGM or online basis, our plans, our budgets. So you have to, you know, even our strategic plans and all this issue, uh, changes in the norms of the uh, network, there is always a friction and friction is a healthy sign as you rightly said because that gives the space to the people that yeah this is my house and i can raise my voice in and someone is there to listen to me and also act on that next is that also uh, one participant talks about dealing with government i think another important point is that like vani works on very contested issues so when you are in a collective form when you're in a form of network you can raise contested issues with the government and government will listen to it the issues which single organizations can't raise. Say, for example, or our debate with government on SCRAs or income tax or enabling space. When, say, even the largest, most influential organization will think twice before raising this issue with the government that, oh, why you are doing this FCRA bullshit with the uh, NGOs. But as a collective, one who takes up that issue and they also understand that, yeah, this is a group. So I think that is, a, that is also a power of collective that as a network, you can raise uh, those issues. You rightly said last year about network of networks. I think there are always a limited resources for uh, net networks uh, because you will find there are some networks which are driven by donors. When the fund goes, the network goes. You will also find networks which are thematic. And the most dangerous part of any network is to do fund distribution. I think that is strictly no-no for this organization. Second is also, it's also most dangerous for any network to do value judgment about its members. You rightly said, even for the membership, even for saying that this member is good, this member is bad, I think that should also not be there. Network of networks is a very important thing. Like, for example, in the limited resources, you can only manage some very few set of uh, membership. We have like 560 members, but with the help of state networks, we are outreaching to 10,000. I think these are some uh, examples and challenges I thought I must share with you. And Sanjay, you are excellent. Uh, your, I saw your maps and all. Uh, formulas, it was quite impressive. Definitely, I think you should take one study of Vani and um, come out with a good report of this. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, uh, and that was that was a good share of experience. I just wanted to add one thing uh, one, before we just quickly move on to anybody else who would like to share. Is that uh, uh, I just wanted to stress upon again that when we look at networks, one very powerful effect of a network is its collective potential because you have more voices that have been synchronized um, and you have the, like you rightly said, you have the ability to bring up issues which otherwise uh, uh, nobody could bring up. Um, but I also wanted to highlight the fact that the effect of a network is um, in its ability to create uh, and not only amplify, which happens because of interaction of actors. Um, and I just wanted to sort of bring that and keep that center stage that you will really be able to leverage power of networks if you focus on 
the interactions between the actors and of course a big benefit is the is the collective energy of all the people coming together right so that certainly right. is there yes. i just want to add that interaction of actors ah, very good is extremely right. absolutely absolutely right okay who else would like to go yeah we Thanks. have uh, a question from suki ayer and i'm going to read that out currently trust is at a perilous low uh, how does one build a bulwark knowing these are possible in crisis like this hi suki good to reconnect uh, it's been a while but um, um i that's a very very important question because um, how do you resurrect uh, or you how do you how do you build back trust um and we we go back to the the question of and i think the bigger bigger questions at hand are to do with uh, with the root and and the portability because in and i'm talking about in the context of network effects i'm no expert on trust building and as as a subject because that is a subject in itself i'm looking at it in the context of of a network effect uh which is what we're talking about today so where is the root of trust which means where does it emanate from does it emanate from someone's authority does it emanate from someone's expertise does it emanate from someone's social status and standing and i think many a times the roots shift uh, or it becomes unclear as to where the root of trust is and that becomes an interesting and important challenge to deal with when resurrecting or reconstituting the trust of a network uh is to to reestablish and peg the root and give it its root nature and the second is uh portability uh, and what happens in transit or what happens in the portability does it in in network effects uh when trust ports or traverses the network it is supposed to either stay constant or improve but what really happens is that it it has a very high risk to actually diminish so the question of portability becomes very very important as to if i trust you and you trust gautam should i trust gautam um uh and and why should i trust gautam first is should you trust me is my root right and second is if i trust gautam and gautam trusts you should i trust you um is the portability and in today's day and age you know covid or other uses of technology and social media etc there has been an enormous portability erosion in the process and the root has got mixed up right so whenever you are designing your programs or initiatives i would certainly urge you to look at root and portability while peer to peer has its own value but the root and portability would be my key concerns thanks sanjay preeta would you like to share your question please Uh, yeah thanks sanjay gautam rohini i think it's uh, great to hear more in detail about uh, the power of network uh, especially given the number of uh, collaborations that are taking place formal and informal um so during the pandemic the last even four weeks of the lockdown we are seeing several collaborative action in healthcare and rural uh, areas like there's a big coalition of large ngos 30 plus and similarly for example swasti is bringing together a huge network uh, looking at healthcare and also socio economic effects but i guess my question is um, you know at times like the which are unprecedented pandemic uh, do you really see that networks would give net positive benefit for example nobody mm-hmm. knows what really works at scale right so talk about your plus one thinking nobody really knows uh, what is the solution let alone solvability um and you know the whole thing is evolving as we see it and you know this is we know the issues but i think um, it's it's all building the plane as you fly it so in these scenarios do you believe that the power of networks remain um works remain yeah can you hear me yes i'm ah so first and foremost networks are unavoidable because Oh. Someone is very angry. Okay, we good. We good? Yes. Okay. Um no, so it's impossible to to separate networks uh, from our lives uh, and it has been so ever since the the our species uh uh started civilizing and the reason is because you may or may not leverage network effects but the networks are will always be there because we are a connected ecosystem 
I think what we are, I'm trying to distinguish between networks and network effects and trying to bring the question back to network effects uh, because networks implicit, uh, explicit, tacit uh, will, will in some form or the other exist, but can we get the benefit? Can we get the value out of the network is where network effects uh, are focusing. And to your question, I think that's a very valid point that when things go through a very uh, rapid and dramatic shift, the, the meaning of interaction breaks. For example, look at what's happening with this social distancing and education or what's happening with uh, the way we deal with COVID and the healthcare system or what's happening with displacement of people and livelihoods. What has happened is that the nouns and verbs went through a complete shift. And I think if we, if we really want to consider network effects as a tool, as a method to, to resurrect some of the things that we should be doing, then we will have to start back with nouns, its attributes and verbs and re, re, rewrite the nouns and verbs in the new situation. For example, if, if there is all children are sent home uh, and, and the schools are closed and we tell every child to, to go ahead and study at home, um, that is a completely different uh, noun to verb connection. The, majority of parents in the country do not know how to deal with this. They don't know how to teach. They may be, the children may be first generation learners. Um, majority, uh, there's a bug that may not have even digital access and the ability to do anything with this. Um, what do teachers do? Uh, what does the entire government machinery of thousands of people who work in the education system technically actually do? Um, and what are its implications for children in terms of time, uh, continuity of education as well as quality of education. All these factors lead us to a place where we have to think about have the attributes of the noun change and do the interactions of the verbs have they changed? And hence, what is network effect? Network is always there. What is network effect in this change noun and verb construct? What is the meaning of, pro what's the promise now? Because the promise has changed. Uh, and I just took an education example. You could do the same thing for healthcare. You could do the same thing for livelihoods. You could do the same thing for safety, security, justice. I know there is a team from Agami on the call today. As to what is the reimagined attribute of the noun? What are the verbs that will change? What are the new verbs that will get induced? And now how do I create network effects with this set of nouns and verbs uh, is, the, is the more important uh, question because promises will change, benefits will change, the tools will have to change. So this kind of a dramatic shift obviously leads to this boiling point. Otherwise, in the normal course of things, some nouns and some verbs change and creep up on you. And since the exponential effects are exponential, we don't notice the good or bad effects unless they have gone too far down the line because exponential things we can't, can't, can't fathom. Uh, in, in, in a normal way. So I would certainly urge all the people who are working on COVID response to go back and re-examine the nouns and verbs um, uh, as a starting point to reimagine what should be the network effect in this change world. Thanks, Sanjay. Do, uh, thanks, Sanjay. Do we take one more question or do you think we proceed because we are close to 12? We can take one more question. Okay. Uh, Aprajita, would you like Anna? to share? Uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, Rohini had a point. So that's sure. Please. Um, sorry to interrupt, but it occurred to me as you're talking, and I should have come in just a bit earlier after the question on trust. What I have seen in the last three months is that, in fact, uh, civil society institutions and their networks have actually risen in trust, right? Uh, people trust these networks more than they trust the government in some cases. And so, how can we, Sanjay, look at why that happened so that we have something positive to build out on? Why did civil society networks uh, actually become in this time of crisis the more trusted agency, agent um, uh, for relief or for, uh, 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 as a resource? Uh, can we dwell on that to understand the positive and then to be able to amplify that? Absolutely, do any point taken? I would certainly um, think through that. For example, it's very evident the work that, for example, Reap Benefit is doing. They are seeing way more trust than many of the other mechanisms, just as an illustration. So, yes, uh, what is causing that and how do we amplify uh, is something that you would certainly 
explore further. Okay. Sorry, Aparajita had a question. Yes. Um, hi, Sanjay. Uh, thank you so much for this. And also uh, Rohini Gautam and Sahana. Um, my question um, is like, yeah, and I think you've touched upon that in the previous, um, you know, section that you were talking about, uh, how do we even design uh, the network and such that it affects sort of cumulates. But, you know, even in the society where the systemic and structural inequalities and power work in a certain way, how can we look at networks within that? And some actors, like, and especially when some actors have like more social, political, or cultural power than others, and it plays out in the way networks sort of unfolds, um, even the values or, or, or the norm creation that happens. So how can the cumulative effect of such a network be something that can challenge the status quo in the first place? Um, how do we look at that? Thank you. Yeah, uh, I would certainly draw attention back to this, uh, and, and I'm sorry if I I'm bring this chart up again and again, because there's, there's a very important aspect. Typically, people who are designing interventions, programs, policies, um, the design mindset uh, stays, um, uh, one second, I'm just getting my pen to work. Ah, it's working, great. Um, typically works in this domain. What, the, what I mean by that is a few policies that are, or a few interventions or a few initiatives that are seen to potentially have the promise of very uh, far and large reaching, large, large reaching uh, or long reaching effects. The question essentially is that the majority of the world or the majority of the people actually reside or live in this part of the network. Which means while the world is trying to move towards micro transactions, micro effect, micro, even policy thinking, regulatory thinking, uh, it has to find its way of becoming much more responsive to context and micro situations at large rather than being large scale. And so what happens during such kind of situations is that uh, there is a there is an urge to create something which is generic enough to work across the entire network, but the entire network is not a human homogeneous, um, and then hence this question of diversity. Right. So the question of diversity comes from the fact that not only the network's nouns are not homogeneous, the verbs are not homogeneous, and hence the network effects themselves are not homogeneous. And so if they are going to be micro networks which are more in these two zones, how do you design regulations, policies, interventions that work? And that will bring us logically to the next question of shared infrastructure, that how do you really design something which allows the separation of context across multiple layers so that in the network, you can do small things, simple things, commensurate to what that community, that set of people, that situation requires uh, because uh, diversity is a strength and typically interventions, um, uh, especially if there are large system driven interventions are designed with what is called as a convergence mindset. That can I make all the problems converge to an answer and then and see if I can deploy this answer. Whereas in reality, civil society and all our social structures are divergent systems, which means that as we traverse the, the ecosystem, things become more and more different and more and more divergent rather than becoming more and more similar. Whereas the quest for solution is driven by finding similarities and designing for similarity, whereas the reality is, is differences. And, and that is the question that we are now walking into saying, what's the role of a shared infrastructure, technological otherwise? is how do you create a, a network that is responsive to divergence and not uh, seeking the comfort of convergence. And that is the complexity of designing a shared infrastructure for, for uh, network effects in a large scale uh, society. Um, let, me, let me elaborate that further uh, through the shared infrastructure conversation and we can come back to this um, as, as we go along. 
shared infrastructure uh, and infrastructure um, uh, itself uh, is a very wide word uh, and of course shared itself so let's let's spend a little bit of time talking about what do you say what does a solution do and what does an infrastructure do right why do we even need to have this distinction so simply speaking a solution solves what does an infrastructure do it helps solve right like uh, so that's that's a very simple difference because uh, people who have a solution mindset they know they think they know the answer um, or people who have an infrastructure mindset think that they have the tools that can help others people find the answer a solution can be replicated whereas an infrastructure can be leveraged it doesn't make sense to replicate infrastructure per se because you know uh, but it can be leveraged to do many many things uh, and a solution like we started the previous conversation last question is context intensive whereas an infra is context independent sometimes it can be context aware depending on what kind of an infra we design but mostly it is context independent and rohini uses this beautiful term uh, which is called we need to build infrastructure which is unified but not uniform so for creating network effects for a large scale societies such as the size of india and a, a structure a network of 1.3 billion people whatever infrastructure we build through our programs or infrastructure that we use has to create a, a set of solutions that are unified but not uniform because uniformity will not work and and the power of network effects is you can embrace diversity at scale that is the whole beauty of of network effects that it, it is very amenable to embracing diversity rather than create um, a simplified uh, convergence of all of these things so i i just wanted to sort of highlight that when we are designing an infrastructure and then the question uh, comes down to saying uh, what is the role of infrastructure in network effect so let's take an example like a simple example which we use in daily life say for example gps right the global positioning system uh, and because gps is a very open shared large scale infrastructure it has given rise to google maps because gps tells you where you are uh, as the infrastructure there's a very interesting case study on the lighter side that when the business case for gps was being presented someone asked the presenter what does a gps do so this guy says it tells you where you are and so he says how stupid is that i know where i am uh, and that is one of the important questions of an infrastructure that many a times it looks so fundamental so basic but it can have transformative effect because if i can tell you where you are and if you if you know where you want to go that is the genesis of the map and if you have the map and then somebody thinks of building some other things you can today imagine how to connect a transportation how do you turn how do you change how transportation happens in this world so infrastructure causes network effects um, and that's why it's very important for us to look at this whole idea of unified not uniform because at the transportation layer where it does not need to be uniform whereas at the infrastructure layer you have the unifying effect for example one of the initiatives that we have been learning a lot from is called echo extended community health care outcomes um, which is um, i'm sure some of the participants are on the call but at the root is the infrastructure to connect hubs and spokes of health experts in tb of course in the last 7 weeks it's all covid but it's about finding the people who know something and finding the people who want to know something and moving the knowledge but the core infrastructure is this ability to actually bring people into a an environment to connect and on top of that are the different kinds of structures to make those connections in the last 7 weeks last i heard they had developed about 2 lakh people across this country on how to deal with and when i say people i mean healthcare professionals it's a network it's a network of hubs spokes super hubs 
people who have knowledge people who need knowledge people who know how to treat people who need to treat people who know how to respond people had that need to respond but what does what does echo at the root have nothing something very basic the ability to get people into a room and be able to connect with each other but that is so powerful uh, because it's an infrastructure on which you can ride with covid challenge you can ride with tuberculosis you can ride with cancer you can ride with mental health uh, because it's an infrastructure so the infrastructure triggers network effects is what i wanted to sort of stress upon uh, when we talk about uh, creating things the question that i would like to quickly traverse through is what does it take to design an infrastructure which can give you network effects right now this could be digital it could be physical it could be your network of people you hire it teams the partnerships you build i would treat any of this as infrastructure right but digital has uh, certain strengths in terms of its scalability in terms of its uh, uh, speed connectivity cost optimization etc but uh, the principles are principles they are as applicable to digital as are applicable to your physical networks uh, as long as you see your team as an infrastructure you can apply this thinking so the first aspect is how do you ensure it is minimalistic because if you desire network effects then minimalism is is extremely important because the more monolithic the more uh, deeply designed uh, interventions you des- you build it will have difficult it will be difficult to create network effects with it because it is not flexible enough to align to contexts and the diversity that we need to deal with so how do you create what is really essential and not get sort of sucked into creating more and more capabilities features bells and whistles complexities because while they are obviously uh, innovative interesting things to do but they are come at the compromise of creating network effects because the more comprehensive the more complicated the more sophisticated a solution is the less is its ability to create network effects because people can't uh work with it people can't extend on it people can't build on it and connected to that is the second important principle of unbundled which means if you do many things then how do you unpack it how do you break it down into smaller things that you do for example if you are in the business of um say livelihoods and you work on training the farmers you work on helping them set up farmer producer organizations give them forward backward connection into into the supply chain both from a market connect as well as from the uh, inputs uh, you connect them into subsidy systems government schemes these are all different different things and each of them at scale have the potential to be a component of an infrastructure so how do you componentize modularize unbundle break it and make them into independent pieces so that tomorrow it's like a car if your tire punctures you don't throw out your car and you buy a new car you go and change a tire and that happens because your infrastructure even if it is digital is designed in a very unbundled modular fashion so if you are leveraging technology to do things how do you design it such that it is in small small modular micro pieces put together rather than one great application one great portal or one great phone app which does 220 things uh, because when networks get large when things move very fast it's very very hard to keep up uh, with the infrastructure and its evolution if it is not unbundled because things will change um and uh, as you achieve network effects things will change faster than you ever imagine coming back to the first slide of we don't understand exponentials um and the moment you start hitting certain multiplication factors of exponential what you've designed will completely creak and break down because it is not unbundled it is not it is not uh, uh designed with the construct of i can throw out any part of my program and attach any other part of the program which could be mine or which could be somebody else's and how do i do that uh, is is an important consideration in designing an infrastructure the third important aspect uh, which i would like to uh, leave with you is interoperability um how do i design my infrastructure my teams my program my knowledge my processes so that they can operate with other people in the sector uh, what are my hooks and connects uh, rather than designing something that can only survive within my four walls 
um, how do I ensure that, you know, if there is somebody else working in water that I can easily connect up and, and work with them? How am I designed for interoperability? And the same is true for my digital systems. How are they designed for interoperability? Because the more siloed, the more constricted designs we have, the lesser will be the network effect. I'm again talking about all that you can design to be a non-interoperable system, but the consequence would be reduced network effects. You will, your scope of reach and scale will compromise itself uh, to, to the extent of non-interoperable design that you have. The other important principle is how do you design systems that are open, which means not only it is interoperable, it is easy to interrupt with, it's, it's open. Uh, you can use my processes, you can use my services, you can use my data, because network effects come when you have uh, open systems. Um, um, and if you have close uh, controlled, uh, what is the term used, which is your walled garden kind of systems, and then it has, it'll compromise the network effects. And you can probably impact 20,000 schools, uh, but it's hard to imagine how your, your approach will impact uh, one and a half million schools across the country because uh, it's with every design principle that we don't put into the design of our digital or programmatic constructs, it gradually reduces the network effect um, because the nouns, the verbs, all that we've been talking about so far starts getting restricted, compromised, uh, and, and the system becomes lesser, less and less capable of creating network effects. So how do you create something which is open, something which is public good, something that can uh, be uh, consumed uh, or interacted with by other people without having to go through um, many doors and windows and complicated process. Um, the other thing which is very important is how do you ensure that what you're building is configurable? Because when network effects start picking up, when you start crossing different exponential points in the, in the growth journey uh, to be able to create impact in our country at scale, um, you will land into situations which were completely un unanticipated, unplanned. And uh, if everything is extremely well designed and, and hardened, if you will, then either technologically or programmatically, it would be impossible to, to respond because then the time gets shorter and shorter, right? Like you're seeing in the, I'm assuming you're watching the COVID graphs every day, right? What is the term used, right? Time to double, which has now gone to whatever, six days, seven days. In network effects, this is a very common thing. What's the time to double? And if your network effects are working well, your time to double will reduce dramatically. And if it, which is what you want. You don't want that to happen in COVID, but you want to happen that to happen when you are helping farmers or educating children or dealing people's uh, uh, with people's um, health, or you are trying to improve the speed at which our our pending cases are court and close in court. If you really got network effects, then the time will reduce. And if the time reduces, the reflex to deal with new and emerging situations commensurately collapses at a very fast pace. And hence, uh, how do you design your underlying architecture, your technology, or your programs, uh, or even your people, your roles, your structures to be highly configurable? The next one I would like to certainly highlight is observable, uh, which is the whole role of data. And, and how do you, Treat data. How do you how do you how do you look at data? What is the role of data? Do you do you use data to control an ecosystem or observe an ecosystem? Because network effects suddenly ex when they start exploding, uh, you have to have very good ability to observe what is happening in the network. Otherwise, it's very 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 quickly you become blind to the network because it's growing at such a pace that you can't see it anymore. So, and I don't want to get technical here, but the role of data, role of telemetry. How do you design? Um, the points from where your system emits data, you collect data, how do you analyze data, has to be done considering, again, the network effects that you want to induce. Who are the nouns? What are the verbs? Do you have data about the respective verbs? Do you have data about the attributes of the noun? And if you were discussing technology data, then we'll go into how do you design your telemetry, how do you design your registry, and how do you design your architecture? But I'm not going down the technology route. But the fact that you are designing your program and your infrastructure for observation at scale, which can keep up the pace at which your network effects will take off is a very important facet of the overall design. 
lastly of course uh, and i don't want to obviously there are go on and on and on about about uh, these uh, different kinds of design principles these are the most important ones of course there are a lot of nuances and today is not the time to go into how do you design digital but the fact is digital gives you the ability to design infrastructure which is minimalistic you also over time which is unbundled which allows you to interoperate between different systems is open for others to connect and form network of networks it is configurable to respond to rapidly changing situations and observable so that you can understand the behavior of the network at scale and hence why in this day and age one would not create an underlying digital backbone is a very important question that one needs to look at so i would just like to sort of uh, conclude with a few uh, closing thoughts and then of course we will take any questions we still have about 10 minutes left so summarily i just wanted to say the the conversation today is about thinking uh, about exponential response uh, i don't know if my screen is freezing or moving uh, chana is my screen moving? it it's moving it's a little slow okay yeah but okay, it's got good. It. so yeah summarily the question is network effects uh which essentially is how do you get more and more actors uh, every actor adding in creates value more nodes more nouns more verbs across civil society government business value interactions so that the verbs improve the number of nouns and their interactions improve the value from the entire network improves and an infrastructure that allows to create the foundation which is open interoperable um and the kind of factors we talk about is the fundamental three cornerstones of leveraging the power of networks obviously sometimes you may not need to but if you are trying to do something with speed at scale sustainably and looking for an exponential response then these are some constructs that i had to offer to you for the discussion today what could you do um certainly give a thought to your nouns give a thought to your verbs give a thought to your controls what's the friction where have you designed for friction where have you intentionally inserted friction or removed it uh because of uh, what you want to really again my screen froze uh, let me see hello okay uh, it's not fully gone through but it's good enough for us to go yeah okay when you're designing the value of each of the interactions between your nouns uh and the verbs that you want to change in the society you want people to do certain things you want people to behave in certain ways you want certain responsibilities to be executed which are all verbs then how do you understand what's the promise tool and and bargain in a certain interaction is that interaction truly viral does one good action lead to many other people doing the same thing or you have to get it done every time because it's very very expensive how do you ensure that the promise of a future interaction is better than the current one so that there is motivation there is energy there is there is a need to cooperate and how do you ensure that the means motives and opportunities to actually drive interaction are improved over time and to power this up how do you architect a shared infrastructure digital or even your programs your structures etc which can support this kind of a network effect because they are minimalistic interoperable unifying in its character um they allow for uh, openness uh, observability etc etc so um let me pause here we have a few minutes we can take a few questions over to you sahana gautam sure um so we don't have a new new questions from this this segment so i'm going to call upon christina would you want to share your question with us please Oh, we do have actually. Yeah. Okay, Nitin. While we are after Christina, we could request Nitin Pandit to share. Thank you, Sana, and thank you, Sanjay, for the presentation. I think uh, my question was around um, the desired level of maturity in the system when you are planning to build a network. Uh, so, would you? say that there should be certain necessary and sufficient uh, conditions around the majority of the actors and interventions in in a system thanks yeah i i would certainly say that uh no uh because as as civil society leaders um 
we we may not want to uh, wait for a certain level of maturity and sometimes uh, and that's the that's the beginning part of an exponential curve that it takes a lot to actually get the basic network configured and going before it truly becomes exponential right exponential does not imply that we see velocity very soon it implies that it has a certain characteristic and we see the multiplication over time so in the early days a lot of work goes into into building the trust building the core of the network and which may not exist so i would not believe there are preconditions but of course if there are preconditions it reduces the time it takes to get to your doubling state so but i would not say that if the such conditions don't exist one should not build a network uh, i would not i would not certainly say that thanks christina thanks sanjay uh, nitin would you want to share a question please Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thanks. Hi, Sanjay. Hi, um, Nitin. Yeah, thank you. Nice presentation. Uh, quick question. Uh, in building networks that become denser and hopefully, uh, you know, more complex and so on, uh, as they engage with larger, larger actors, uh, the I found that the ability for the platforms to be self-explanatory uh, not necessarily simple because the problems are complex potentially, but self-explanatory becomes an important feature of the platform. I just wonder what is your experience in platforms that can explain why to the users as they get configured for different applications or different end uses. Uh, so it's not just transparency, but it's the ability to explain. So. Uh, right. Uh, so the experience has been that platforms and ecosystems evolve over a long period of time, uh, the networks and the platforms uh, over a long period of time. So what happens in the process is, uh, and, and I'm rooting this in, in thinking about uh, uh, how people's habits change. Um, for example, today we are able to do, and not only us, you know, a large number of people can deal with WhatsApp and YouTube and what have you. Um, without any uh, substantial instruction sets is because uh, it, 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 it evolves along with the habits of the network. Um, and it gets more and more sophisticated over time. Uh, and the capability of the network uh, also improves uh, over time. And you would see the same factor in civilizations as well as in ecologies that... Uh, so to your point, uh, improving people's uh, ability to improve a certain digital infrastructure uh, is a function of two things. One is, what is the speed at which, that's why the whole plus one thinking, because if the evolution of the network is very fast, if the if evolution of the digital infrastructure is very fast, and it's like plus 100, and the network uh, ability to respond to that change is plus one, then obviously you need a very intense amount of uh, education, explanation, self-explanatory nature, et cetera, because it's, it's extremely hard for anybody to absorb that kind of change. But if you are dealing with plus one to plus one, then it gets easier, relatively speaking. And so that's one side of it is, what is the speed of the infra and what is the speed of the network effect and how are they synchronized? That's one. Second is, how are we looking at the changes that we introduced in wave one baking into habits of people before we introduce wave two uh, so that you don't create this constantly increasing cognitive load of what needs to be done. And that is why many a times in network effects, you will roll out certain parts of your intervention in different communities at different point in time, uh, just because there is a certain speed at which uh, the wave one habits take to form before wave two habits are introduced and wave three. So what we have seen so far is wave thinking and plus one thinking uh, as uh, aspects. Of course, you can always on the platform do all sorts of explanatory things and help and all those, but those actually potentially don't work to a very large extent. What really works is the speed at which you, you drive micro changes, uh, so more like drip irrigation rather than a massive rainfall kind of a problem. Thanks. Um, 
And we have. I am respectful of everyone's time. It's two minutes to go. Yeah. So, huh? Okay. So then we we will close on that. We do have a few questions. I would from... love to. I know. I yeah. think we should take all the questions, answer them, and share it back with the group yeah. through kind of yeah. a, some kind of a document. Yes. Yeah. But I would love to hear uh, uh, yeah. any thoughts that Rohini has. No, thank you, uh, uh, everybody. The questions also were interesting. Now, uh, really, what I'd like to see is uh, uh, people finding a way to share back with us what they find of all this that is useful. And as you had earlier said, what are the examples from their own operations they can bring to share with the rest of the group? Because this is only as good as the actual network that is... that. This network has to really internalize the idea of the power of this network. So I would like to see more examples coming out of this group. They can be sent to Sahana. They can be collated and sent back to the whole group. But uh, very profound, Sanjay, and uh, yet um, I think fairly relatable. I hope we can all take practical lessons, as I said in the beginning. And I want to really uh, say that uh, all the civil society organizations I've been dealing with since the, since February, since the beginning of all this, you know, I really feel like this is a good time to salute all of you for what you do. And um, I hope and pray that we can do more together using this idea that now is the time to innovate further and uh, uh, about using uh, the power of networks to be more than the sum of our parts. And I think we have a head start now, Sanjay, because of what I said, that suddenly this whole civil society, what people can do on the front line, working with actual citizens at the first mile has become very important. And that trust is uh, very clearly visible between the citizen and the civil society organization. And so how do we capitalize in a good way on this trust and keep expanding the circles of this trust. Thank you. Thank you, Rohini. Thank you, Rohini. Thank you. Uh, you know, just wanted to acknowledge that we do have questions from Dr. Manoj, Shiv, Devyani, Ajender, and Am Aman. So uh, noted, and we will share your res share responses to that question. Suki, Nitin, Shiv, and Devil, thank you for your comments and you know sharing your thoughts on this topic. On that note, thank you, Sanjay, for hosting this very engaging whiteboard. You, you kind of gave us the feeling that we're not so virtual after all. Um, some sort of a transition for us. And uh, thank you to each one of you who participated in this, in this conversation and for keeping the last 120 minutes very engaging. We hope you found this useful. Uh, you got some, we hope you got some constructs to kind of work with, some tools, and certainly most, uh, most importantly, some questions to ask as you start thinking about this um, for your organizations, for your missions. We hope to stay connected. We will, uh, like I said, share resources with you. We will also create an FAQ document based on your questions that have come in. And we would, like Rohini mentioned, would, would love to hear from you what, you know, what, 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 what are some of the things that you are doing in your organizations, examples, um, and then we could circulate it with this group. We'll also send a feedback form to kind of understand what we could do better and what you liked. Um, on that note, thank you once again. Um, Gautam, do you want to share anything? Okay, maybe he's, maybe he's saying thanks. Okay, so thank you Sorry, once yes, again. Yes, I was saying, I was saying <laughs> yes. thank you. Yes, um, go ahead. No, I was just saying thank you. Oh, okay, great. All Thanks, right. Anna. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Rohini. And thank you all for participating. This, uh, this was a tremendously, le tremendous learning session for me as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Stay safe, happy, and healthy. Take care. Thank everyone. you. Bye bye.